Welcome to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we tackle the hottest legal topics of the week in the U.S. while unwinding for happy hour on Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. and drinking wine. Today, (laughs) we are talking about Casey Anthony. Lots of things have been coming out in the news. We've got this new documentary, if you want to call it a documentary, out right now, which Chelsea has done us the favor of watching. And we've got a lot of questions about Mm -hmm. the case, what's happening with the case, what's happening legally, and what happened with the fallout for civil cases. So that is our topic for today. I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm Chelsea Rogers. And this podcast is brought to you by Tarani Law LLC, because you never need a lawyer till you do. Perfect. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Yes. Cheers to Friday, the Happy, 16th. happy hour. Okay. Definitely been a long week. And yes, Friday, December 16th is where we are. And because it is our weekly wine, we want to talk about the wine that we're drinking. Yes, absolutely. We haven't been paying for this. This is literally just the wine that um, is in my cabinet because I like it. I went for my anniversary trip to Manassas, Virginia, where Bull Run, and we came out with the Commendador, Commendador, I don't know how you pronounce it, <laughs> but it's a lovely wine. It's yes. a red wine uh, from Bealton, Virginia. The Morace Vineyards and Winery, forgive us if we've said that wrong to you guys who have done it, but it is quite a delightful red. Yes. I'm sharing it with you for the first time, Chelsea. Yay! And we're going to put that back out. Um, And while we go through, we're going to, I'm no wine connoisseur, but I know what I like. And we're going to see if you have any comments on the wine that we're drinking, then please feel free to. Any suggestions? Yes, we would love suggestions. This is going to, this is our first. But it will be a weekly series. Yes, weekly series at 4 p.m. every Friday. So if you have a suggestion for us for wines, Please drop it in the comments. Again, we are no wine connoisseurs, but we like wine Mm -hmm. and we'd love to taste the ones that you prefer out there. We're starting with my favorite. Next week, Chelsea will bring yours. Perfect. And yeah, let us know in the comments. That way you can join us, like I said, every Friday at 4 p.m. for happy hour to discuss sort of the hot topics. So this one is Casey Anthony, which I remember watching Casey Anthony's trial live. Um, she's often been called the OJ of my generation, which she is. She is, and I think you just have one of the, like the most compelling stories, right? You have the young mom, and this is again. So we talked about OJ earlier in the week. I'll have to check it out. Yes, check out the Law Unscripted every Tuesday. The one this week we just talked about OJ Simpson, who was of my generation, <laughs> the original, <laughs> the original OJ Simpson. So now we're talking about your OJ Simpson. Yes. So, okay. I think OJ had a really interesting thing we talked about. It was on the cusp of sort of journalism changing, reporting changing, news changing. Yes. Casey Anthony was too, but it was social media. So she Mm. was at sort of the cusp of MySpace, Facebook era. Yes. Which is what made it so salacious, right? You have this beautiful toddler, Kaylee. Gorgeous missing. little girl. And she's missing. And she's in Florida. And then you have the mom who's very conventionally attractive, young, 22 years old, but all of her sort of partying pictures from like Facebook are being circulated. Yes. And that's what became so bad was they're watching her party with her Facebook pa- page and her pictures on yes. her page. And people would see her out. This is in Florida. She would be out at like fairly local popular places. But okay, let's start at the beginning. So Yes, walk us through it. So I am the, (laughs) I know a lot about O.J. Simpson and was able to give a little bit more commentary there. I am happy to chime in, but please tell us you're much better with Casey Anthony because it was, yes, I was alive. I didn't drop off a bridge, but I didn't focus on it as much as I did for O.J. Simpson. So walk us through basics. Yeah, so I think in the same way O.J. was for you, it was at a, I was middle school into high school when Mm -hmm. this was happening. It was something that was on the news all the time. I very much remember watching it happen. So this starts in 2008 and goes all the way through 2011. So we're spanning a a significant point of time. And this is where the story starts. And this would include the new documentary. This is where 
and I say documentary lightly, that would, that would indicate some sort of, um, unbiased perspective, which is not present in this. And possibly truth. Truth. Yeah. That was not present in this as well. Or at least maybe, maybe a little. Well, that's maybe oh, this is what she'll say, which I had to pause it for a second during this documentary. One of her favorite things to repeat over and over. She was like, I was a pathological liar, but every lie I told had a nugget of the truth. I never want to, <laughs> to smack someone in the face more than I did. So, so she was, but she's not now. Is that the idea or? So she says she's been to therapy. <laughs> what a millennial answer and no longer lies. Um, that she has a good relationship with the truth now. Which do you need a relationship with the truth? Apparently. Apparently. I I guess I kind of thought it just happened. It was, it is. It's kind of that's the point of the truth, you would think, to be sort of factual. Apparently not. Um yeah, I didn't know you needed a relationship. Apparently the Maybe felony we're convictions. <laughs> You got to date the truth to know the truth. I don't know. Okay. What do I know? Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I've sidetracked you. No, you have not sidetracked me because I have very clearly lots of feelings and opinions about this woman. Catch her in the alley. It's on site. Um, (laughs) Let's please don't do that. um, Yes. Sorry. This is not to indicate any (laughs) nonviolent side here (laughs) uh, and may not be used in any, you know, criminal prosecution against me in the future. This was not premeditation. This was a joke. No, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) This was a joke. Okay. So this story starts in July of 2008. Okay. But what we don't know at that time. So in July 15th of 2008, the police department receives a call from Cindy who is Casey Anthony's mother. Okay. So there's Kaylee Anthony, who's is the, the, child. the little girl. Mm-hmm. Casey, who's the mom. And then Cindy, Cindy, who is, I'll probably refer to her as the grandmother in this case. Probably easiest. Yeah. So she will become a big figure as well as her husband, George, as the grandfather will be reoccurring characters in this melodrama that shouldn't be. So yeah. that's where we start is July 15th, 2008. The police department receives a call from Cindy, the grandmother stating that her granddaughter has been missing for 31 days. Wow. So we thought this story was starting middle of July in 2008, but really it happened at minimum June 15th. Okay. And the the 911 operator seems fairly confused about the call. Well, because what, yeah, what would you do? She seemed confused about the age. So Cindy calls mm. the 911 operator, and, it, and the 911 operator is seems to think that the missing child is like a 15-year-old, 16-year-old who seemed to run oh. away. Because of, what, what else would you think? Has been missing for 31 days. Right. Why would you wait that long for a toddler? A toddler would make no sense. And so after the initial confusion with the 911 mm-hmm. operator who you can gradually hear bless 911 operators and their ability to stay calm but you can see it go from confusion to like this being sick to your stomach you can just hear it in her Ugh. voice that something here is very wrong yeah and so she asks Cindy the grandmother she said well is your daughter who's Kaylee the missing child's mother is she there with you Cindy says yes simply the 911 operator says well can i speak to her She says, sure, and hands the phone over. Mm. And this is where the lies start. From the moment if her lips are moving, she's lying. Now, Um, is this the lies you're saying they're starting there, but does that mean that they were proven in court that they were lies started there? Or that fully admits at this point. That's what she's admitting in this new quote documentary. She was We'll get to it, but she was convicted of lying to the police, and these are part of the lies. They start in this moment. From the very beginning of the first 911 call. The first thing she says to the 911 operator. Wow. Change almost instantly. Wow. So this is the point when, if you saw this on the news, there was a nanny. Zany, Zanny. How was it pronounced where you heard it? Allegedly. Allegedly. I didn't, I can't pronounce it, um, but you're right. uh, Zenadia. Zaneda or Zaneda, yes. Zaneda Gonzalez, I think. Yes. Is the, Canola, is the name that Gonzalez was Fernandez. used. Gonzalez Fernandez, yes. Yeah. So in this initial 911 call, Casey, now that she's speaking with a 911 operator, says that her daughter has been missing for 31 days. Mm. And it's also in the most flat, unaffected tone I've ever heard. Um, oh. And she doesn't seem worried. It's almost if she's taking a math test. It's just at that level. Wow. 
Anne says she's been missing. I dropped her off at the nanny's house. There's nothing. So obviously the 911 dispatchers. We got to find the nanny. Right. Like this, where's the Amber Alert, Bolo? Like this is an emergency. Yes. You would think. Well, that's why we have the Amber Alerts is for little children. Is finding lost little children. There's also the policy that if there is a missing child, the FBI has to be notified within the first 48 hours Mm. to, because of how mobile we are now, just crossing state lines is easy. And, you know. Yeah. And that, but that's why the feds get involved is that's one of the the legal aspects. Right. Because it's crossing, it's. More likely with the little child. Yes. That you're possibly tr- crossing state lines. Yes. So the feds have to get involved because they have cross state jurisdiction Absolutely. rather than just Florida being involved. So that makes sense. It makes total sense. So that didn't happen at this point because Kaylee has now been missing by everyone's account for over a month. 31 days. Which I cannot wrap my brain around. I'm a fully grown adult. Woman, and if I hadn't talked to my mother in 31 days, she would be sending out the police. Right. right. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> so that's where it all starts. She says that she last saw her daughter with a nanny and that she's able to take the police to where the nanny lives. Well, they go to this apartment complex. Did she give them an address? Oh, she rode with them in the car. I don't remember that part. This I'm saying. There's a lot of details that are were shocking to me because obviously I was... Not like a young child, but I was a child when I watched this. So my perception of sort of what happened and a lot of the small details that as an adult are the most gripping to me were lost. That was the same with me with OJ, as we were talking about earlier this week, is there was an emotional perception that I had Mm -hmm. at the time and a factual perception that I have now that in some ways is very, very similar and related. Yes. But in others, it's like, oh, wow. I totally didn't pick up on that yes. in the way that it was happening at my age range. Yeah. But for you, it's really fascinating of how you're seeing that too. Yeah. And I think that was the thing too. And this is a small thing, but she was 22 at the time. So as a child, that's an adult. I have no concept of 22. Right. <laughs> right? Like that is. <laughs> it, and technically it is an adult. But right. Like <laughs> legally it is too. It is legally. But in your mind, you know, between your mom and a 22-year-old, they, they're the same. They're grown-ups. They're right. adults. Even at, you know, middle school into high school, they're they're different. Now, as someone who is older than 22, we'll, we'll stay there, <laughs> older than 22. You're still younger than me. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. Not it's by much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but so older than 22, um, and you can reflect and think about being that age, which I think only made my disgust for her grow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's unfathomable to me, this behavior. But we'll, we'll quickly go. She says that her daughter was last seen with this nanny. On the 911 call, she says this woman has been her nanny for over a year and a half. Um, and she takes them to this apartment complex and walks with them, two officers, up to mm. the door. The same day as the 911 call to where she says this woman lives. They knock on the door and the apartment has been empty for six months. Like there's, Wow. So the light, like it's an immediate lie. Um, do you know, and I'm skipping ahead yes. a little bit, um, can you confirm whether that was one of the lies that she was actually convicted of? The, yes, or do you so know? part of it. Okay. So the, the, because she accused the nanny of essentially kidnapping her yes. was what the story became. Initially it was like, I just last saw her with the nanny. Then she very much to the officers said that this woman must have taken her child. Mm. Um, she didn't use the word kidnapping, but that was what she was saying. It's the implication. It's the implication. And she said, took her, left with her, just not the word kidnapping. So that was proven to be untrue, false. Yeah. Um, And I'm not sure if that's what they included in some of her charges, but it absolutely was in court proven to not be true. Um, Casey, by the time from 2008 to 2011, when her trial was, admitted that that was not true. Um, And then again, in this documentary confirms that there was never any truth to it. Um, In this documentary, she admits that the truth was that she met this woman once. It was introduced to her as a friend of a friend's babysitter. And And the poor woman doesn't, from my understanding, this poor woman claims she never even met Casey Anthony at all. Yes, she, she has no. She didn't meet her. She has no recollection of them meeting. And the way Casey describes it, at least in this new documentary, is almost in passing, which to me would confirm the um, Zanny's story of there's lots of people I've met that I wouldn't remember again. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of what 
Casey said was like, I met her, not even I had a conversation, but just in context, I met her. So from the jump, it's a lie. Like it is very clearly a lie. The police officers describe that being perturbed by her affect demeanor. They're trying to find a lost little girl. Yes. And the mother seems to be no help. Mm -hmm. Um, so they do investigations at some point, And this is what I could never figure out. Um, a car that was used by both the grandparents and Casey, because they lived together was impounded. We don't know where it was. It got towed and impounded. And this was during the investigation part. Yes. Okay. So this is within about a week of this all happening. And the grandfather, George, and the grandmother, Cindy, I don't know who exactly went down first. We went to get the car because I believe their names were on the title. They shared the car, sort of a family car situation. And they claimed that the trunk smelled like decomposing remains. Oh, Cindy said that, didn't she? Yes. It was the grandmother who said it. It was the grandmother. Yes. Um, And the man who owns the lot also confirms that that smell was present. What a lot of people have said is that once you smell it, you know. Like, if you've ever smelled that before, you would recognize it again. Um, And he said he had had cars that had had remains in them. Right. And it was very clear to him. And now we get into something that I think is interesting. And this is sort of the questionable science, which has a legal aspect of it. So from the beginning, they then are using cadaver dogs, which have questionable reliability. Around the car. car. And then they bring them to the home too. But the canines do alert on the trunk area. And I apologize. I'm going to pause this for a second. Your beautiful dog, Olive, is sitting by my little chair. We're on on bar, pub, stools, and table, for those of you who can't see us. (laughs) We are literally at a bar table and stools. Um, So Olive is finding us quite high at the moment and is very upset that we are so high. So I'm leaning over and petting Olive, and you might hear a little clitter clip clap. (laughs) Pitter patter as um as he walks yes. around. Um so anyway, that's what's happening in the background. So but sorry. No apologies needed. We are pet friendly here. We right? love it. We yes. love our dogs and I love your dogs. So. I love yours. Yeah, they're they're asleep they're around asleep. here. Um you won't see them in the video probably, but they are sleeping on all the various uh locations around the room. So yes, Olive absolutely. is more curious than anything, but I digress and just yes. wanted to, no, to talk so about the amazing it. dogs who are hanging out with us tonight yes. for happy hour. Valuable members of the team. Yes, they are. <laughs> As always. And you know, a good little break in the truly heinous things we're talking about. Mm. Um, it's kind of a downer, obviously. We're talking about some of the worst things. Yeah. So, but to go back, the cadaver dogs and their accuracy mm. is something that is not without fail to say the least. And so when you talk about this, if, you know, as evidence being presented in court, that's not something that is necessarily going to stand up to a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, it can be. So I've used a lot of, I've done a lot of cases with drug dogs. Um, I did a lot of prosecutions for drugs, drugs and guns. And it was common. We had, we did canines yeah. and I loved them. Um, clearly love dogs, but anyway, <laughs> we love it. We, it yes. Yeah, so nothing's better than a dog, but a dog with a job. Love it. Even better. My <laughs> dogs are so lazy. They need to get a job. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, if anyone's um, hiring dogs, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Since this is happy hour. Um, yeah. So we have, we had a lot of the, the dog sniff evidence yeah. is we used and it wasn't like you're saying it's not infallible because most of it is y- you're relying on a subjective view mm-hmm. of how the dog is alerting. Yes. Whether it's alerting on drugs, whether it's alerting on yes. something else is the, beha- you have to have a person who knows the dog's behavior mm-hmm. so intimately that the only thing that that behavior indicates is, is that the, yes is the drugs or the body mm-hmm. or the whatever that you're you're looking for yes so it's not just a i mean we all assume i think in watching shows etc is like oh yeah. the dog alerted of course there are drugs well maybe usually usually that is what they are trained to do it's a very precise science um wow and we oh. have we have 
But it doesn't seem lights. like a ghosty is yeah, with us it, in the room. it really does. I don't think they like what we're talking about. Um, so I'm going to flip this real quick. Okay, and beautiful. We, yeah, we have flipped a switch and changed some okay. lighting, which is unexpected. But, but we'll roll with the punches. We will. So, yeah, so dogs. Yes. Okay, so that was part of it. And okay. I think there have been a couple other cases where the dogs and their trainers, and like you said, they work so closely with the handlers that yeah. that is – another person you're bringing in and people are people and people have faults. And so, and the dog can't testify and the dog, that's the problem. If the dog can't can't testify, the credibility of the handler become, can become an issue. It's the only thing is that the handler is the only one talking. So they have to accurately explain the dog. They have to know the the behavior of the dog and they have to be truthful on top of all of it. Exactly. And just like in any case, you're going to have a direct and a cross-examination. And I'm not an attorney yet, but I think that is something that to me is a less credible form of evidence. You could cross-examine. Like that to me is, there is doubt in that. There can be. If done properly and reviewed well, it's absolutely a place for great cross-examination. It can be done. It doesn't have to just be accepted and walked away from, but it is credible. It is it's credible, very for sure. credible, and especially it's if you have evidence. one for a longer time. Yes, right. it is absolutely admissible in almost all states. I believe if not it's all, all states, um, but it is something that I think that in a case like this, where up until this point there is no physical evidence, right. and this being the only thing, it became a lot of a case that was played out in the news versus having a lot of evidence up until a certain point. And we'll get to that. Yeah. Please um, continue. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying not to you- be so long winded, but no, it's, it's good information. And especially for the people who don't know the case as well. And I'm trying to catch up yes. and remember again too. So it's great to have the extra information and we can always do a part two and three if we have to. Perfect. The documentary did. Yeah, there's a lot. Just and I saying. think that's, I will say that I'm not hitting every detail. I'm hitting sort of the points that were most salient to me. Another one of the lies early on that was proven to be false was she claimed to work at Universal Studios. Oh, this one I remember. And she took the cops there like she did to the apartment that turned out to not be real. And they they re-interviewed one of the officers in this miniseries, and he said he had, had a gut feeling the entire time she did not work there, but she would walk down this hallway waving to people, and they kind of oh were, like, God. waving back, but not like, oh, hey, I, like, hey, coworker, but like... It's like, what do you do when someone's hey, waving at you? Yeah, of course, wave exactly. back. Exactly. And then she said, or excuse me, he said she turned, and then it was a dead end of a hallway, and she kind of looked up at them blankly and was like, yeah, I don't work here. <laughs> And he says in that moment that it was like, oh my God. something is so wrong here. You know, you get called you out. You have to at that point. What I do you mean, think? If not before, but especially by then, and something is terribly wrong. Yes. And so, it, again, in this docuseries, she said a nugget of the truth. She had worked there at some point, like freshly 18, had worked there, but it had been years. So she's like, there's a nugget of the truth. And I'm like... But what does that count what for? What does that count? Okay, that's the that's the question to me. Is like, I don't care that you based your lie off of a truth. Right. I care it's the lie. So again, now at this point, this is when the sort of public opinion comes in because you see these pictures of her hardcore partying. Um, she'd gotten a tattoo during this 30-day period where her daughter was seemingly missing and it was sort of on her shoulder. And it, I believe it was in Latin, but it said like living the good life, which... I have never ha- been a mother of a missing child, but I'm going to stand by the statement that that's not a good time in your life. Um, and so... Not usually. Not I mean, usually. You wouldn't think so. You wouldn't think so. Um, so then she's partying. All of these pictures yeah. are surfacing, and it is spreading like wildfire. You sort of have this 24-hour news cycle, coverage constantly. And they're giving these press conferences. Um, I say they, the grandparents and... And um, Casey, Casey Anthony, almost said Kaylee, Casey. So the three of them, the three of them sort Mm -hmm. of a united front. We're looking for our granddaughter. If you have any information, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, these pictures of her in her party girl phrase, like, you know, if you want to party, live it up. But I've been there. I've done that, but I don't have a toddler. And I think that's a key difference. And I think the other, the other thing is the, the biggest contrast is people who, in other big news stories yes. of missing children, of missing family members, 
is they're going out and putting pictures of their lost loved ones on trees and telephone booths, you know, telephone poles and anywhere else they can find to say, please, have you seen my loved ones? I mean, we've got the billboards. People put them on billboards. And instead of doing that, she's spending her time at a club. Right. And not report. I think there was not really a, a point in public opinion that she was looked fondly upon because the moment this story broke, she had never reported, she had never reported her daughter missing. Her mother, the grandmother was the one who called it in. And it was a month after apparently the last sighting, which I can't, even now, again, as a, as an adult, that is incomprehensible to me. So that's what happens. I think the police are immediately suspicious. The public's not having it. They are protesting outside of her home. Yeah. Um, and then within the course of this investigation, shortly, a um, couple months, she is arrested, but not to do with her daughter at all. She had stolen checks from one of her friends and been shopping and paid for things with checks when you could still During do that. During this time. Still? During this time. Wow. Um, so she's then arrested for a larceny charge um, and she bonds out. So she's criminally charged. Yes. But for an entirely unrelated matter. Entirely unrelated. Committing another crime. Yes. Or a crime. We don't know that there was one originally, but committing a crime. Committing a crime. And so there's like the, she'd be at Target and she's clearly paying with a check. That's not hers. Mm. Um, She bonds out on that charge because it was not super serious. I mean, don't steal. But It's serious. I mean, it's more like a a forgery, but it's more of a financial crime versus like a, a violent, yeah, yeah. A violent crime. Um, it's while she is out on bond for that charge that she's then arrested for child abuse and neglect, which was interesting because she was not arrested because at this point we don't have any physical evidence. We don't have any physical evidence. We have the alert of the canines on the car. That there might have been remains. That there might have been remains. And that's really it. That's really the only thing we have so far. Um, so she is then in jail. There's a lot of really interesting clips, sort of her on the phone with her family in jail, um, saying, I hope we find her, which I roll. I just cannot. I cannot do it. Um, because so she. Okay. Yes. She was in jail in these clips. Was it for the charges of child abuse? Child abuse. Okay. So there was the first crime yes. of the financial the financial theft totally unrelated she gets bonded out very quickly and then she gets arrested for child abuse and neglect couple- of Kaylee. Kaylee okay yes and then she's held without bond yes okay or or such a high bond that she couldn't pay i'm not sure but which if effectively it is is the same thing right so she's in there and there's a lot of because obviously if you're incarcerated you are being watched you're being recorded um, yes. Yeah. Pro tip. Yes, you are. Um, don't confess to crimes on the jail phones. Just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, if it's not your attorney. No face, no case. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> <laughs> they do record phone calls. Yes. As a former intern at a PD's office, I listen to them. Guys, don't confess to crimes. I used them. Yeah. It just... I used them in my prosecutions. As a prosecutor, I used jail tapes. Yes. To prosecute. Either to as substantial, substantive, substantiating evidence yes. of the crime they were currently being held for. Or other crimes. Or an entirely new crime. Or witnesses that are now co-conspirators. Yes. All of the above. So, so yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of these, but truly, these are chilling because I've listened to jail calls, you've listened to mm-hmm. jail calls. She's, and there's a video of it too, sort of almost in the movie setup where you're like at the clear thing with the the telephone, with you know what the, I'm talking yeah, about? With the telephone in the wall. Yes. yes. And so there's a video of this and you can see sort of her face, which makes it chilling because she is just sort of flat faced and mm. I, you know, I hope we find her blah, blah, blah to her parents. And that's the, what I remember. Yes. And that's the grandmother, what I remember watching on TV. Yes. And the grandmother, Cindy is like saying, I don't remember what the quote is exactly, but she's like, what do you know, Casey? Where is she? that sort of like pleading with her and you can hear the emotion in her voice and Casey's like, I, you know, I'm a mother. I just feel that she's still okay. Which now we know what we know is heartbreaking because while she's incarcerated for child neglect, because she never reported her toddler missing, I think is how they were able to 
abuse or neglect was arrest her on that charge. That was the basis that was the of basis the criminal of charge. The arrest yeah. of, that is clearly negligent. Right? So while she's incarcerated on the child abuse and neglect charge, they find Kaylee's body, which is heartbreaking and just truly upsetting. There is essentially like a meter worker who will come back later into our civil suits. Uh, yes. He absolutely shows back up in the area of law that I'm familiar with. Yes. So yes. his name is Kronk. Last name, not like Kronk pull the lever, but like. Right. Yeah. Let me see. Um, you're going to hear me ruffling, yes. rustling papers here. Roy. Roy, Roy Kronk. Kronk. So Roy Kronk discovers skeletal, skeletal remains. Right. Which I'm not a science person. But skeletal means it's been there for a while. Skeletal is decomposing. Um, They were not able to identify the remains sort of by looking at them. Not by sight. It had to be DNA matched to an an existing DNA sample of Kaylee's. Um, So it kind of gives you a perspective of how long the remains had been there. Um, And it was kind of in an out-of-the-way area. How close was it to the home? It was less than two miles. Like, it was... Which is, again, crazy to wrap your head around that... That close to the that home. That close. All that time. All that time. No, but how long had it been? And maybe you don't yes. know on the timeline because I know it's a hard mm-hmm. timeline. How long had it, had it been from the time that she allegedly actually went missing Yes. to the time that her body was found? Six months. Wow. So her body was found on December 11th, 2008. Um, and so if we remember, the 911 call was... July 15th, but 30 days before about ish June, June, middle of June. So about six months, um, out in the Florida weather, you know, it's a very humid climate. Oh, especially in the summer, especially in the summer. And then you have the rapid to cold. Um, so yes, they had to use DNA to identify. Yeah. At this point, Kaylee, uh, Casey, I keep mixing their names up. They're so close. They are close. They, and I think obviously that's intentional. So Casey Anthony, um, I'm not sure exactly when she, there's a gr- uh, grand jury convened, decides to indict her. Um, but the trial doesn't actually start till like 2011. Yeah, it was because yes. she stayed in jail. She was incarcerated the entire time. The end, Right, the entire time. Yes. She either didn't have bond or couldn't make enough to get out on bond. We, mm-hmm. we can't recall. But she... I think once the body was found, there was not an option to bond out. Could be. We'll have to look up. And I don't I, I don't not, practice yeah. in Florida, so I don't know their, their laws and how their bond actually works, their bail system. Um, but, but that's entirely possible. So she... Was she indicted originally by the grand jury yes. for murder yes. or just the neglect? Murder. Okay. So, once, so that's sort of when everything in the case changed, was once the remains were found... You sort of have this immediate shift. And you can also say the public outcry at this time. Mm-hmm. I think this is like peak when I remember it. Like I remember being home on like a, a winter break, a Christmas break, and seeing the coverage of this. You have that people Kaylee again, was found. That she was found, right? Like I remember being in the grocery store and seeing um, like people magazines, all the like little tabloids reporting on it. So at this point, they're, the, you know, they convene a grand jury. The grand jury chooses to indict on murder. Um, and again, with the court of public opinion, all of these photos, these stories, think about it. Anyone you've ever met is now going to come and talk about yeah. what they think about you, what they think about you as a mother. It quickly, it very quickly became the story of a party girl who didn't want a toddler anymore. I think that is the narrative that the press used and that the prosecution ran with. And that's how I remember it in yes. the news is that was, even if those weren't the exact words that were used, that is my emotional response and rem- memory of how it was portrayed yes. is a girl who did not want a little kid who was too young, thought her life was too, had too much life to be lived without a little girl. Mm-hmm. And so she was going on without a little girl. That was absolutely the portrayal that I picked up on. And I don't think that's really false. You have, again, that, that 30, 31 day period, I think is where a lot of people It didn't matter what came after that. You didn't report your kid missing for a month. And during that time, you were quite literally dancing on tabletops, getting tattoos. And hey, live your life, but not if you have a two-year-old. 
And it's not that I want to judge how someone chooses to grieve. I think especially with press, it's really hard for people to Mm -hmm. go through some sort of tragedy, a missing family, family member, a murdered family member, and their every micro expression is being judged. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I think it was very clearly clear in this case that something was off, something was wrong from everybody, you know? And so I think there's a, there's a, there's a line to walk with that. You know, you don't want to, people grieve differently, people process differently, but I think this is outside of even those normal extremes. So, and this is where things get horrific and interesting at the same time. So you had these protests outside of the courtroom throughout the trial. So now we're in 2011. Right. That's, and that's where my timeline yes. picks up a little bit. So we are Sorry in, for the paper, paper yeah. shuffling again. That's where I go back to my notes. It starts May 24th, 2011. Yes. So that's when the trial starts. Correct. And this is when the defense drops their bombshell. Because as we know, legally, the prosecution has to turn everything over to the defense is sort of what their evidence is, right? Correct. Um, the defense generally keeps their defense strategy quiet. And they can't. And they should. They absolute. It's different in criminal and civil yes. law. Um, kind of our theme for the week is what is the difference yes. in criminal law? The prosecution has to turn over a lot of things mm-hmm. to the defense, or it's but, a Brady violation. <laughs> right. It's it's a violation. Yes. But the defense doesn't have to reciprocate. Absolutely. They don't have to do the same thing. Which it, is fair. In a criminal case. Yes, in a criminal. But a lot of people don't think that it's fair. And a lot of people don't know that that's not true. In a civil case, it's equal. You yes. each get to, to ask. You each get to take. You each have to give. Right. Evidence is exchanged both ways. But in a criminal case... That is not true. It is the prosecution who has to give anything that might, just might, Mm -hmm. help the defense to win. Yeah, or even if it's kind of new, right? And I think that that is something, especially in this case, that was important because this was a death penalty case. Yeah. Initially, what I learned over this docu series was they offered her a plea deal. What would you say? Okay, I'm gonna. I'll, I know what it is. I don't. I don't what would even you have remember offered? This. No, I'm gonna this say is shocking. No, no, to no me. I, I don't, don't want you to remember. What do okay. you think you would have offered as a prosecutor or accept or advised your client to accept if you were on the defense? What do you think would manslaughter. be manslaughter? Manslaughter. And how many years? For a child, mm-hmm. I would have done. In thinking of it, I would have given probation time, so okay. I would have probably have said. I'll do manslaughter, but I also don't know the the limitation of how many years you can do manslaughter. So it might only be yeah. 20 years, but yeah. let's say it was 20 years. The max the of the max. manslaughter. That if the max of the manslaughter was 20, I probably would have said, I will give you all 20 years and I will suspend 10 years. Have you served 10 years, suspend 10 mm-hmm. years, subject to probation? You're way nicer than this prosecutor was. <laughs> And it, now that's, you know, not knowing all of the right, evidence right, right. and everything I did not else, give you, but... I did not give you all the information that would be contextual, and I don't know what the limits were. But what the prosecutor offered was manslaughter, 20 years flat, done. But... And yeah, that, that might mean that they had more. Yes. Or maybe she didn't want to do probation, just a flat 20 years, but that's fascinating. So, okay. But the reason... Why? Do you want to know why they turned down the plea deal? This is interesting because we've had a lot of conversations about this recently. Yeah, um, you and I have. Plea deals, you can basically negotiate any sort of conditions, you know, if it's important to a victim's family, whatever needs to be in there. So part of this plea deal was an allocution to the court of what she did to Kaylee. That she would have to say it in court or that the prosecution yes. would be able to say it. No, that she needed to allocute herself to the court oh my all of the facts. Like, step by step, what happened? And that's why she refused. And that's why she refused. She said, I was not going to confess to something I didn't do. So it's like when somebody says, I'll give you a deal if you tell me where to find the body. Yes. And they won't tell you where to find the body. Exactly. Wow. And so I think that was a difficult thing because what we knew before the trial was that the cause of death was not clear. Mm-hmm. Because of how sort of decomposed the remains were. But there was not... And so little. And so little. What they could tell was there not was not really a sign of trauma. There wasn't a, 
bullet hole. There wasn't a blunt force trauma. So a lot of what evidence we you know know now would be in the tissue, which was right. degraded. Um, it so, wasn't obvious from the bones. Yes, exactly. So there was not a clear. There was not a clear cause indication of death. cause of death, which is what I think the public really wanted to know is what happened to this little girl. How did she die? How did she die? So that was why the prosecution required that she would need to give, and basically up until their purview of what was sufficient information. Interesting. Um, and she said in this documentary miniseries, no, God, I'm so sorry. So fine. I that, have really not that drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I have not drunk that much to be changing my words, nor to be hitting tables like this, I swear. Uh, But that is apparently what is happening. Please continue. No, you're totally fine. So that was the thing, is that she, and she says this in the docuseries now, who knows what the conversations were Mm -hmm. at the time of why, you know, maybe the max was 40 years for manslaughter. I don't think it was, but, and so 20, you know, whatever the, or 20 was the max and they thought. Just take it all. Right. And so we don't know what really the conversations with the defense team were at the time. Now, you know, all these years later, she's saying, I wasn't going to confess to something I didn't do. But now that we did that little, little sidetrack, here's where we are. First day of trial. We have opening statements, which fun fact for everyone, closing arguments and opening statements are very different as to what you can say. Yes. So this gets interesting. And essentially it's because like in opening statements, nothing has been admitted into evidence. And so... You can say certain things, and there's just bounds on what you can say. Right, because you you are not sure yet if you yes. can prove something. You're seeing what the evidence should show, yes. what you believe it will show, yes. what you expect it to show, but not what it did show or what mm-hmm. it is. Exactly. That has to wait. Um, you can say, you know, we, the state, are going to show blah, blah, blah. We, the defense, are going to prove this person's innocent. But you can't sort of guarantee something because you right. don't know what's going to be admitted. Um, kind of a technical point, but I think it's interesting. And it makes it kind of easier for me to understand when you're watching these things. Absolutely. And so, as the defense has sort of kept their defense strategy silent, this is where the bombshell hits. So we have a packed courtroom. We have hundreds of protesters with signs saying baby killer, T-shirts, outside of the courtroom. You have a packed courtroom for a journalist and sort of bystanders who could get in. Yeah. And in the opening statement, the defense says that the grandfather had sexually abused Casey Anthony, which created her tendency to, to be a pathological, pathological liar. Um, and then there was some sort of incident. And they're not clear in the opening statement, but some sort of incident prompted by George, the grandfather, that led to her death and that Casey was so traumatized from being sexually abused by her father that she went along with him this entire time. And that's their defense strategy. Which, if true, if it actually is or was Mm -hmm. or would be true for her or for anyone, then how tragic. Yes. Truly how tragic. And, And yes, there's a lot of psychological crap to unpack with that. And it may absolutely impact every Mm -hmm. action you take. And I absolutely believe that. And I will say, obviously I'm no expert here, but watching (laughs) her, (laughs) watching her speak and sort of the behavior we saw even back then, I think it's extremely likely that at some point in her childhood, Casey was abused. I will say that. I think kids don't And people said this even before Kaylee's disappearance is she would lie about little things constantly. Like she just lied. I don't think that comes from nowhere. I don't think that pattern of behavior. We don't know. But if it did, at this point, the question is, and you know more Mm -hmm. about the evidence, was it proved though that she was, or if she was abused Mm -hmm. by her dad or was it more general? So this is where it does get interesting. So there seem to be no reports really ever before the defense launches this theory of abuse by her dad. Now I'm going to introduce a new character. Okay. Her brother, Lee, who's her older brother. Oh God, I forgot about him. Right. But this is- I totally forgot. Is he still around? I didn't know he had a brother. I honestly don't even remember. I didn't even know. I had no recollection that there was a brother, but this is where it does get interesting because even prior to Kaylee's disappearance, she had had conversations with past boyfriends and some- close friends and disclosed that her older brother had sexually abused her. 
So that was previously discussed with somebody. Yes, there were, I believe, two or three witnesses. One was a, a previous boyfriend, and I think two were female friends. Wow. That they said, yes, we were friends at this time prior to Kaylee's disappearance. She did tell me, you know, I don't have physical evidence, but she said that her older brother had abused her, but said nothing about her father to them. So the first time the, the father's, father's brought ever in mentioned in terms of abuse is opening statements at a trial for murder. Yes. And the press went wild. I mean, you can just imagine the frenzy. Yes. And you have to think that, like I said, I be- after just seeing her talk, knowing what I know, I do believe she was abused. I don't know by who. I don't know when. But I, be- in my heart of hearts, believe that she was abused, likely sexually, at some point in her life. Um, however... We get into this trial, which, and this is the difficult thing with sexual abuse and sexual abuse allegations is there's not proof. And I understand that. Like if you, yeah, especially that long later, especially that long later, those, those type of things are hard to prove anyways, because, and that's the nature of the crime, right? Like you are taken advantage of in a vulnerable position and that does not happen. And, you know, especially out in the public, as a child. especially as a child, Especially it, yeah. late disclosures too. Like I don't expect a child who's being sexually abused in their home to then disclose then. That makes they, they usually or sometimes yeah. don't even know that they're being abused. Exactly. It's later when they start learning about Getting other older. people and other families that this doesn't happen in yes. those other families. Yes. And something might be wrong. Exactly. And I think that that is something that I'm not here to, I, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't with her. I didn't grow up, but I do think she probably was just with the convictions and the, pe- the people on both sides, prosecution and defense who evaluated her seemed to come to that conclusion, but it gets very difficult to say who and when. Um, but yes, the dad, there's no one who could say she'd ever accused her dad or disclose that her dad had abused her prior to opening statements. So then he becomes bombarded with the press. You know, he's there to of course, theoretically support his child, you know, and his granddaughter, however you want to see that. But then it's, I mean, think about the moment. This is a lifetime movie moment in the courtroom of everyone just whipping their heads to look at them. Is there any, the, what <laughs> my mind goes to is the dad, George, right? Yes. What was Did he thinking? Did they alert him? that they were going to accuse him of abuse. And if not, talk about a moment in your life you would just want to die. Yes. Whether it had been, and even if he had abused her. Yes. You know, let's say he had. Even if he had, if that's the first time that you're hearing those accusations is in the middle of the entire United States that's watching you on TV. For your daughter's murder trial. Mm-hmm. Or granddaughter's murder trial. Right. The, uh, your daughter's your daughter. defendant. Yes. I, can't, I cannot imagine. And he is either a Juilliard yeah. trained actor or it was the first time he heard it too. Um, so I have to, do they have? Is it? There's small clips of it you can okay. find on YouTube. Well, you'll have to look it and up. there has to be more because there's also, what, at least one movie about it, I think, is it yes. Rob Lowe's in yes. a a TV movie. And I think there's and been like made for TVs based off. There's a law and order episode with Hillary Duff that's based off of her. That's right. And I think Marsha Clark, the prosecutor for OJ, yes. didn't she do some kind of investigation? I think so. She or investigative report for kind of the like Casey? bobblehead commentary. I think so. Yeah. I think so too, but I'll have to go back and look. We'll all go look. Yes. So, okay. So you have this truly like cinematic moment in the worst mm. way. Um, wow. Right. And so no one has heard this. This has never even been like in the rustlings of conversations. It's behind closed doors. It's behind closed doors. It's attorney client confidentiality. Okay, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so you have this moment that I think, and I like to try and think about what the jurors are thinking, which as much as you try to, you try to have Shocking a jury moment. that is unbiased, but in this case, I don't think that's possible. I mean, it's very much like a Scott Peterson and OJ. Everybody knows. It's hard to be completely unbiased. Completely unbiased. It really is. You know, you're not going to get a jury that says, I've never heard of this. You're just going to get a jury that says, I've heard it, but believe I can remain neutral. So they think they're coming in for this murder case. You know, the, the disappearance, the neglect, the murder of a toddler. And it is very quickly, which you would think, oh my God, that's the worst thing you can hear. And then it very quickly gets worse, right? Like, I can't imagine that moment in the jury box of saying, 
I was chosen to do this incredibly like hard thing anyways. And it just got worse in the only way it could. Well, and then the other thing, legally speaking, okay, yeah. so trial tactics, yes, trial strategy, you're a prosecutor and you are prepping to voir dire the, the jury, to interview the jury before they get chosen. You're putting together all the questions that you think you should ask them to determine, to suss out, are they going to be biased yes. in any way? Is there something about this case that would trigger hit, them, trigger them put, hit a nerve in some way? And you have no idea that this case is about to be about child abuse. Yes. And as a prosecutor, if I had known that, You're my questions to the jury would have been, has anyone ever been involved in a child abuse case? Yes. Has anyone been the victim of abuse by a parent or a close family member yes. or something? You'd be asking the jury members these questions. But now you haven't given the jury any prep. They, yes. You don't know who on those those jury members, all of those jury members, you don't know what their triggers are. Yes. Because you didn't ask them because you didn't know. You didn't know. And so I think this is the interesting thing, too, is that when you sort of craft your... And I, again, I think the prosecution very much used what the press was saying. It seemed to be a clear-cut story of a 22-year-old party girl who got tired of having a, have a toddler at home and either accidentally or intentionally got rid of her for a lack of better word wording. Um, and how quickly that seemingly clear theme, clear stories flipped on its head because then it becomes, she was sexually abused. And so she was acting out at these parties because mm -hmm. of the sexual abuse. And it kind of takes your prep and throws it out the window because yeah. Right. Then you have this whole line of that. So the trial ends up to make a long story short. I'm so sorry. I feel like I've been speaking forever. No, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And as much as it's in the news, it's, it's the good details to have are the missing. extra details. Yeah. So the trial goes on for a very long time, similar to the OJ of six weeks. It is a six week trial. Hmm. Um, and they have, I think it was almost 60 witnesses. I mean, it is a very intensive, um, what comes out during this time also is that either, and I'm not sure I didn't read the transcript of either sort of um, inferring or flat out saying, she says that Kaylee was a product of rape, that she was raped at 18. And that's why the father is not involved. She doesn't really know. She was drugged at a party. Um, but do we even know who the father is? Even now? There is a man who has been named, but it's not confirmed. Um, but that seems to be the sort of, of line of things. And so it draws a lot of things into question. Um, you know, and we'll talk about this later with the civil suits of standing of like, who is Kaylee's father? I don't believe there's anyone on the birth certificate. Um, and then mm -hmm. she sort of makes this claim and she says it flat out in the documentary is that I was assaulted at this party and, and Kaylee is a product of that. So you have a lot of this sort of compounding sexual trauma that's asserted, mm -hmm. And then you have this six-week trial, 60-ish witnesses, and then the jury goes for deliberation. And you have the second-by-second second outside of the courthouse. The protesters are still there. And you have, I believe the jury deliberated for 11 to 12 hours, um, if I'm not mistaken. Only. Only. Which, not days. And we, I do have to mention this. She was not yeah. just charged with murdering Kaylee. She was also charged with lying to a police officer, or lying to law enforcement giving a false statement. Right. That um, was at least four, four counts. counts. Yes. Okay. Um, so in a shocking landmark decision, not, I mean, not landmark, but just a shocking, I think to the general public and still it's hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, she was acquitted of Kaylee's murder. Now she yeah. was found guilty of giving false statements to police officers. But, all four times. All four times. But because she had been incarcerated, pending trial, it, it, it eventually worked out to time served. Yeah. Um, I think that she would have gotten four years and she had served like 11 years or excuse me, three, <laughs> three, years. three years, like 11, 10 or 11 months. And so it essentially worked out to time served. And so she was like, when the trial ended, she got to leave, she got to go home, um, and, and go out into the world. Did she go back to her father's house? No. No, um, which did not stop the protesters and 
picketers from being outside of the parents' house. Um, they seem to have not had a relationship since. Um, maybe Why watched, talked you? once or twice, but really not had that relationship since. I mean, when you think about it, the grandmother's one who called it in, essentially mm-hmm. accusing her daughter of doing something to Kaylee. Um, and so part of me, under- the sort of analytical part of me, understands why they were not able to convict her. They weren't able to determine the cause of death. That's the big one for me. Yes. Is how do you prove that she was murdered if you don't know how she would die, how yes. she died? And I think the only reason truly that Emmy was able to rule it a homicide was because there was duct tape found around the body. There's no indication that the duct tape was placed there. To Pre-mortem. Pre- right, yeah. right. Prior and to so, death. How would, how would you know when it was placed? Right. So there seemed to be some insinuation that maybe an accident happened and they responded inappropriately, which is how the law and order SBU episode takes it. That's what they do. That was the plot of the thing. Hillary Duff plays it. It's ridiculous, but that was the thing. An accident happened, responded inappropriately, compartmentalized because of past trauma was able to completely, you know, sort of a, I think what the psychologist ends up saying on this mini series, which I think is interesting, I keep hitting this mic, but is that... <laughs> it's okay. I keep breathing into mine very funny. <laughs> <laughs> but that people who experience trauma in childhood often have an emotionally immature response to things, mm. which means compartmentalizing, um, which, you know, if she never disclosed the abuse is this bad thing is happening. I'm going to pretend like it's not. Stick my head in the sand. Yes. Which might translate into the behavior that we sort of saw in the 31, 32 days of maybe an accident did happen. Right. And she did, you know, she hit a body, she moved a body, and then pretended like it didn't happen. But why did the grandparents wait that long? That's the question. So here now we're going to... Because she lived with them. Yes. So... And at the time, she had a boyfriend that she seemed to stay with for, like, sort of periods of time at his apartment. So I think there was just so, something there. Something there. Okay. Um, and I now what she claims happens. So this is what she said in the, in the series is that she was at her, her mother and her father, the grandparents' house, asleep where they lived. Um, she put Kaylee in the bed with her um, at two years old. So you're not really worried about you know, co-sleeping right? to take a nap. They're in the bed together. She said she wakes up and Kaylee is not with her and she walks out. Um, and her dad, she's like, where's Kaylee? They both start looking. She says she kind of goes, I'm not sure of the like layout of the house, but like goes back towards the bedrooms to look in those rooms, that area. And he goes outside and she says, when she comes back up from that hallway, he's holding her body. Um, and she's dripping wet and clearly not alive. Um, that, that she was blue and cold. Like, there was not... And this is the first time that's ever been said. asserted. I mean, this it's is what, the first 2022. Time. Yes. yes. Um, and so this is her claim, is that that was what... That that is what happened. Um, she says at this point, and this is the part that is believable to me. Now, do I know if that happened? No. Is that a conceivable series of events in my head? Sure. Sure. What happens next in her now story in 2022 seems crazy to me. It's so, such recollections or reflections of, here's how I would have killed her if I did it. Yes. I mean, it's such O.J. Simpson material. And I I would argue that that goes towards people who do things like this, are narcissists at heart, that there is just no self-reflection. That's why it was kind of nauseating to listen to her talk in this, because she truly believes she's the victim here, that that her that she's more of a victim almost than her daughter was, um, which is... And her little girl is the one that's dead. Is the one that's dead. So in her story next of what happens is essentially her dad says, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, and leaves. Um, and, and that she believes somehow, and this is... I don't know how to explain it any other way, but she says she believed Kaylee to be alive and somewhere else that her dad had taken her somewhere and that everything was going to be okay. And that her lying to the police was because her dad told her to. Mm. And that she just kept saying, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm supposed to do. Um, And that he has her and that she'll be okay if I behave in this way. It seems to be what her story is. I know that sounds sort of confusing and crazy, um, but that's 
that's is what confusing. she said. That is yeah. that is what she said, and I don't know how to make more sense of it than that. Um, Has the grandmother said anything all of this time? No. Um, are the two together still? The grandparents? To my knowledge, yes. Bless that me. they are still together. Um, she. What a trauma to go through to stay together. Yes, and she at the time said she'd never really heard of any of these allegations. Her daughter had never come to her. She had no inkling of like, she never had a feeling that something was going on and that she believed they were really baseless. Um, so mm. that's, so yeah, so that, that's our long winded story of how we got there. And the, that's the criminal result and that we sort of mentioned it in the OJ episode that she could come out on the street corner right now and say, I murdered my daughter. I did it. And there's I nothing we can do about it. And here's how I did it. Because that's double jeopardy. Yeah. Um, because she has been acquitted by a jury of her peers in the court of the law. Uh, which she is. She could, though. Be c- civilly prosecuted. No. She- <laughs> charged. I'm not charged. Not <laughs> Go back to our Look. law unscripted. Okay. So, yeah, she, she could, could still be. Um, suit. A lawsuit, yes. A lawsuit. She could still be sued civilly for certain things, depending on who it is and what they're charging. This is the question I have. Mm -hmm. And so this is unclear to me as my, you know, three LOL here is here. Um, I understand that you sort of have to have standing to file a lawsuit. I believe her, Kaylee's grandparents, Casey's parents, could be, are legally able to file a suit. Is that correct? A wrongful death suit? It depends. Okay. Um, it depends on your state. I am not Florida Bar. Such a lawyer answer. It, is, it, depends. Depends. it depends. There's there's always an exception. There seems to be always an exception yes. or something to be argued right. that it may or may not apply. For for Casey Anthony's case, mm-hmm. I am not a Florida Bar attorney. Of I do course. not practice in Florida. This is not legal advice. We are not. It is. It is your not. attorneys, <laughs> nor hers, nor anyone else's yes. for Florida. Um, we. But from what I can tell by yes. my review okay. of Florida law, I do not think they would have standing. Interesting. And standing is just that they would have the ability to sue, that they would be an interested party, someone who could recover something. Yes. In most states, including yeah. Florida, if there there are wrongful death suits. Yes. Like O.J. Simpson, classic case that Nicole Brown's father and right. Ronald Goldman's parents sued mm-hmm. after the the murder trial, and Goldman's parents sued for wrongful death. Yes, it's we kind are of the saying, classic example. Absolutely classic. You are responsible for our son's death. Yes. So wrongful death lawsuit. We're going to prove that you're responsible for our son's death, and we're going to get a money award for yes. it. Yes. For Casey Anthony, this whole case is very odd. Yes. There are wrongful death lawsuits in Florida. Yes. There absolutely are. They operate to the best that I can tell. Normally, where the most interested person in such a lawsuit would be a spouse, if there's a living spouse. Yes. They absolutely have a financial interest in being the surviving spouse of one who's dead. Very easy to demonstrate damages. Absolutely. Parents. Yes. Actual parents do. Um, so if we believe Casey, she could file a suit against her father. Yes. If yes, see, you are Look headed that. in the right way. And this is where it gets fun, not in an exciting, funny way, but legally speaking, it's legally interesting. It's fascinating. These are where the games come in yes. and they're, they're not games because they're people's lives. But they're played and used as a strategy, yes. as if you're playing chess. And some people play it very, very well. Yes. If she were truly believing yes. that her father caused her daughter's death, yes, then she is actually the proper party to sue her father for wrongful death of Kaylee. Yes. But... It is not vice versa. Right. To the best of my knowledge in Florida, a grandparent cannot sue for wrongful okay. death of their grandchild. Interesting. They can sue for the wrongful death of their child, but I don't see in the law that I've yes. looked up any way for a grandparent to be. 
that was, I did a brief skim and that was sort of what other attorneys from Florida had seemed to be saying. So this would be my next question. And this gets into a, like a family law, interesting part of, because there's not a father to my knowledge, a yes, listed on Kaylee's birth certificate. Um, so there is, you have sort of the custodial parent issue, the, did he give up his right to be a parent? And at what point did that invoke? Because two is still fairly young for that type of thing. And there's no official court proceeding. So if someone was right. able to come forward and prove they are Kaylee's father, would they be able to bring a suit? Biological father. I know Te- legal father is different. Technically, yes. Okay. Um, because at least on the face of it, yes. they fit. They fit within that statute that yes. says... You are a proper party because you are a parent. But this is where the there's always something to be argued comes yes. in. Yes. And in this particular case, and this was actually, it's interesting that you mentioned this because it actually goes toward the O.J. Simpson trial. Because oh. there was um, there was a huge issue with Ronald Goldman's mother suing. Okay. So both of his parents who were estranged. Yes. Estranged. 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 <laughs> They they each sued on their own behalf. So okay. his mother sued and his father sued. Yes. There was a huge outcry about his mother because apparently she had abandoned the family at the, the age when Ronald turned eight. Oh, wow. So the question was, was she truly a proper party? Because even though she was his biological mother. There's a difference in the law. Was there really damage to her? What did she lose yeah. by him dying and as an adult because she wasn't losing comfort or relationship right. or, you know, friendship? She wasn't losing anything by the death that yeah. seemed like at the time that she was potentially just cashing in on Which the is, death of her son. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that she was or she wasn't. I, it but just this is the argument that was, becomes in court. Exactly. And so you say... Does this person actually have standing? Okay, yes, yeah, she is the biological mother of mm-hmm. Ronald Goldman. But does that mean she can sue? Yes, probably. But in the end, and this is what I have to go back and look okay. at, is I don't know the breakdown of how much she was awarded versus how much the father was awarded for the wrongful death claim for Ronald Goldman. Fascinating. Because that's where it differentiates, is a jury could say, okay, you technically can sue. Sure. But what did you lose? Right. If I'm going to give you, because a wrongful death claim, especially for a child, yes. is it's a, you have to prove a loss of something. Not just that someone is gone, but what did you lose? Right, because right, we're talking about civil, not criminal. So yes. you're talking about monetary, essentially. My own personal, what did I lose? As a spouse, it's easy. Relationship, yes. friendship, consortium, yes. money. Right. All of this stuff, hopes and dreams and all these. All of it. Everything. With a child, it's a little harder. You are the parents. You do have, this is my child who I love. Yeah. All of this. Companionship, for lack of better, like legal exactly. terminology. And right. sometimes financial support. Right. Let's be honest, especially if a parent's older, that they could sue for lack of financials, you know, yeah. or for damages of and you have like an adult child, right. Exactly. But for a, a little child who is dead yeah what do they really what have they lost yeah i, I mean a child so please don't this misunderstand is legal me this are, is yes yeah this is not me saying this is the least fun nothing. part of the law when you're just making up i mean you're not making up you're divvying out how much does a life cost a lot right but this truly. is what we tell our juries to do every day Every business day in America, a jury is asked to decide what is the financial amount of a person. Yes. And their injuries, even if they're not dead. Right. What does a limb cost? What does an injury cost? Permanent facial scarring cost. And they have to come up with it. So in these wrongful death cases, especially where it's a child who's there and has provided financially for a family, yes. it's harder because you right. can't say, well, they would have made $20,000 this year that could have been put toward our family expenses because they don't make anything. Right. They're not child actors. They're not talking about no. that. <laughs> so, so Mommy bloggers. But <laughs> Yeah. So you have to have a unique relationship with the child yes. and a parent, a mother, a father are in unique situations that right. almost every state that I know of recognizes that yes. a parent would have a a true loss 
of a child. You know what I think is so interesting? This is such a tangent, but, and it just shows how the law varies significantly. Um, You talk about the special relationship in this circumstance, but in a criminal trial, you have spousal privilege, but not parental privilege. You're absolutely right. Which I think is fascinating. That is fascinating. It's something I think about a lot because I'm, in my mind, um, as an unmarried person, um, I'd much rather my mom not be able to testify against me than some <laughs> unknown man. I just, all, all the dirty secrets your mother, that's what I'm saying. I would much rather like protection from that. If I'm, I'm calling your mother. <laughs> hey mom, you're on candid mic. Can, can we patch her in somehow? <laughs> but Episode truly, two, Chelsea's mom. <laughs> honestly, but truly I think about that. I would much rather like protection from the things she knows than any future man. Like I'm <laughs> Sorry for attention. I no, thought that would I be a funny it. addition in because this it's is dark. Yes. No, it was well, well placed, very much needed because yes. So yeah. Um, but it just shows how the law can vary because you do have someone has standing in this. There's a, a special relationship recognized here, but it right. might not be recognized in another in another instance. Right. So the father, so going yes. back and here, Sorry. I know I'm the one who's rambling, but know, for my it. rambling is... The father of Kaylee Anthony, probably, even though he legally may have grounds to sue on the face of it, it is doubtful that he could prove any damages worth suing for. Fascinating. Because what would a jury give him if he's never even come out for her her life? If he's never even announced himself while she was dead in like, this murder trial and all of this press coverage, yes. then it would be hard for a jury to swallow the idea of, well, he's a grieving father. Fair. So I think it's not so much that he couldn't sue, but what would he get? Yes. There's nobody's going to give him anything. So why would you spend the time and the money to There'd sue? There'd be no point. Any attorney he went to for a consultation would probably tell him that answer. I, I would hope so. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's somebody who would do it, but you would think, someone who's going to be like a fair. Attorneys don't want to lose money either. Let's be honest. And that's, that would be expensive to pursue. It would be expensive to pursue. And if Not you know the there's public. nothing. Oh, do you want to step into this can of worms? I mean, in 2022, and we're still talking about Casey Anthony. Yes. She's just come back, recircled herself back into the public eye. Nancy Grace is talking about her again. Yes. And we're still talking about it. I, I mean, I, I think it's relevant, though. So we've talked a lot about the criminal trial. And, of course, there are lots of details. Um, if there's something you think that was important I left out, please let me know. But I tried to hit the highlights of what happened. Of course, there was a, you know, so a lot of back and forth. There was six weeks of it. If you want to see it, you can watch it on YouTube. But And I think it would be interesting for us to, in another episode, do hit a some of the evidentiary portions yes. of it. Because we are a legal show, right? This yes. is what we're interested in is how legally it all works. And I think that that's the hard thing for me because truly in my heart of heart, not logical point, I believe she either was negligent or had some part in her child's death. Even if it, or even if it was a cover up. Even if it was an Something accident, happened. a cover up, her behavior after, all of it. I think sh- there is some fault to be placed on her, even if it was not intentional. And I truly don't know, but in my heart of hearts, that's how I feel. Now, my legal analytical brain understands why she was acquitted, which is such a hard thing to say, but there was such a lack of physical evidence that I don't know if I would have been able to sit on the jury, see the evidence that was presented to them and convict somebody in a death penalty case. right? Right. And I think that that, of course, they're not supposed to factor in sentencing and that part of things, but how can you not? Yeah. I better be sure. from the beginning, this is where we go back to the jury voir dire. They're asked at the beginning, would you be able to give the death penalty if it was proven? And they have to be able to say at the very beginning. So it's not like they don't know. Well, that's the thing. I think even if they won't, if they're trying to keep them separate, because I definitely think there are people who deserve to die for things they've done. For sure. But I don't think the evidence was convincing enough. And I think maybe if there had been a lower penalty on the line, people would have been willing to be more influenced by it. I don't know if that makes sense. And I think it's it human nature. Perfect sense. It's what happens on juries all yes. the time. Because juries, 
They, yeah. They're supposed to follow the law. They, they, I think, truly want to in most cases. Yes. But there is the human factor. Which you can't take out of that it. That you cannot take out. And whether they say, eh, well, it's an insurance company and we don't like the insurance company. We don't think this person was hurt very much, but it's an insurance company. I, so I'll give them extra right, money. Like, like Geico. Right. Like, right. <laughs> So right, so there's that factor. There's the factor of you know the Goldmans is it did okay. Well, it's his mom, but did his mom really have that much of a relationship? There are all these things that you have. The human consideration yes doesn't leave the human jury yes, it which doesn't. I think is simultaneously the best and worst part of the legal system. It is because you just have people who don't know yeah. And, and I say that in the most loving way possible because after three years of law school, I think I'm less sure of the law than I was three years ago. <laughs> like We've disillusioned you from the law. <laughs> no, I think I've just truly realized how complicated and nuanced it can be. Yeah. That there's something I might have asserted with full confidence three years ago that now I will just say it depends and give it in a balanced answer. It's American University, right? <laughs> yes. Washington College of Law. You're doing yes. a fantastic job with this it's one. It's true. But I think that that, I Props. mean, I don't know if that was just my experience, but I think the more you learn about the law, trust me, there's no judgment on my part for juries because I've studied it intensively for three years. And I'm like, I don't know, man, <laughs> on a lot of things. But speaking of that. I don't know. And I've been practicing for over 17 and, and I don't know. it changes and the jurisdictions change. So now we yeah. get into some less dark, kind of more ridiculous parts of this case that were less known. So we're going to talk about a couple of the civil suits. So we kind yeah, of talked let's check about our time yes. here for our happy hour. I'm honestly not sure when the we The time started. we started. I'm not sure either. Um, so we'll take another little bit. Yeah. And it'll be quick. Yeah. Let's do the civil suit. And if we don't hit it now, there's Always, Always next yeah, happy if we, hour. you have questions, let us know. So here's the quick part. So there were two that have happened. We kind of went over who could maybe sue in a wrongful death. Yes. That seems to be pretty much out for the, for the most part. In I, this case. Unless there's something that just jumps out and I don't know. Yes. It doesn't seem. Not that conclusively, but who's probably do not. a wrongful death suit? Yes. There is no person that I know of who has standing to, speak to for sue. Kaylee. Or who would have damages to claim. Yes. Yes. To speak for Which Kaylee. is very upsetting. So we have two other civil suits that have happened. Yes, we in do. In the course um, prior to this mini series, but that are briefly mentioned. So the first one we have is a defamation suit, which that was probably the first thing I learned in law school in torts was that defamation and libel are very hard to prove. And they're most of the time not worth pursuing cases. Even if the person was clearly defamed, it is Unless so difficult. Unless you're Johnny Depp. Unless you're Johnny <laughs> You knew I had to go there. But it's true. <laughs> hey, look, if you have Johnny Depp money to throw at things, do what you're going to do. Yeah. But for the most part, it was, I mean, that's towards 101. Those claims are generally pretty hard to, to really hash out in court. They are. They're so hard to prove because yes. through defamation, you have to prove that it was false. Yes. Which is almost as hard as proving it was true. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. And then you get into, so then how did it impact you? And well, was that what impacted you or was it you were on trial for it? So it gets into a lot of that. Anyways, the first one is from the woman who was named as the quote unquote nanny. The fake nanny. Yes. So mm -hmm. she was a real nanny, but not for Casey Anthony. Right. And to the best of our knowledge, Has she, no, she doesn't remember meeting her. Like we said, nothing. may not have. And so she ever. says she was defamed. She mm -hmm. said there were picketers and protesters outside of her apartment. She says they were evicted and she had two young children at the time. So she was worried Gosh. for their safety. You can imagine, I mean, uh, you can imagine of what that was. That's an impact. I mean, that's a true impact right. to a life. To a life. And so she sued Casey Anthony for defamation. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere. They got this, the case didn't produce any. She didn't never got any damages. She didn't win the case. They, was there any finding or was it just dismissed? It was dismissed. What was it dismissed on? Because I remember the case. Because they did depositions. Oh. They did discovery. They did depositions, which is a very interesting thing. Um, oh, fast. The lawyers got kind of snippy. And there's this one part I'll tell you about that was interesting. So this is obviously after Casey has been acquitted. 
They are now doing these depositions in this defamation case where she asserts her Fifth Amendment privilege to not self-incriminate over and over and over again. At one point, she says it, and then you have the nanny's attorney Mm -hmm. saying, well, what pending crime is she preventing herself from being accused of? Which was interesting. And so they get into a little snippy back and forth about that because it's, that's not really how the Fifth Amendment works. Well, it is. You 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 take it because you're protecting yourself. From incriminating. From incriminating yourself for a crime. For a crime. Mm-hmm. So I think the sort of deposing attorney kind of snapped back because the assumption I think everyone's operating under is that the crime she would be incriminating herself from or incriminating herself is not the defamation. It is, because that's civil, she's talking about the kidnapping murder of her daughter. It would have to be something other than murder. It would have to be kidnapping. Or or abuse of a corpse corpse. or whatever is still within the statute of limitations able to be proved. But yeah, it couldn't be murder. It's not a civil case because you don't have a Fifth Amendment if it's a civil action. I think that's sort of what the attorney was trying to say is that the only thing she could... I think that was the sort of underlying current is that, well, she could only incriminate herself for the charge she's already been acquitted of, so you can't assert that, right? which is not how it works, but it was a fun exchange between the two. Oh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, And they clearly were being very snippy in that portion of the transcript, which, I mean... Fair. For that kind of deposition, I, a lot of attorneys in simple depositions in a couple hours get, get irritated with each other, and that's still not good, but I can only imagine. How frustrating. Yes. So then we have the second one. I would one. have been infuriated. Really? That's what you're going to say for this question, too? Let Over me ask you another question. Over 60 times. Yeah. Which is so upsetting. And then it, I really do I feel bad for the woman. I've been wanting to drink during the deposition. Cheers to that. Not just a happy hour. <laughs> So the second one that came about was from Roy Kronk, which... The poor guy who found who Kaylee. Who found the body. Yeah. Who was just doing his job. He was where he was supposed to be. There seemed to be no... Like, and thank God he did find her. And thank God he did find her. And there seemed to be no indication of... From anyone other than Casey Anthony that this man was just doing his job. Um, however, she did also name him. Um, because it... If you'll remember at this time, when the body is found, she is incarcerated. And at that time, in a conversation, she says, well, then he had to be the one who did this to her. Um, so basically saying he, he killed did her. It. He killed her. This is the guy who did it. Right. Don't look at me. Look at him. That's the only, right. He, the only reason he could have found the body was because he put her, put her there, essentially. Oh. Um, which, again, you think to your life, like, how if some you one are dealing with the trauma of finding a toddler's body yeah. um, while you're just doing your job, and then the mom says, "Yeah, and you're the murderer." And it's you. And it's you. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Um, I think it's he did get impact. lucky that there seemed to be no public belief of that at any point in time. But I do believe it probably still impacted him in some way. However, it was also dismissed. That suit didn't go anywhere, which is kind of confusing to me, um, considering it was thrown out in federal bankruptcy court. (laughs) So we'll have to look at this, and we'll have to follow up in the comments. Um, But here's my... and, And here's where I haven't done as much of my research on this, but here's how I know bankruptcy works in civil cases. Okay. Because it hits mine too. Well, yeah. So she got the whole thing started. She got char- after her acquittal and the in the conviction of the four charges. She was ordered to pay back two hundred seventeen thousand dollars for court costs and the expense the expense of the police for the investigation because of her lies. Because of her lies, right? right. So that it was directly is- related to the the conviction <laughs> for lying. So she had all of this money. Um, when That's she, called restitution. Yes. Mm-hmm. And when she filed bankruptcy, she had $1,000 in her bank account and still this, you know, 200 plus thousand dollar debt. So how does that relate to Kronk's, well, the liver Kronk, um, civil case? As I understand okay. it and how I get it. And I handle, as you know, I handle a lot of um, civil cases, yes. mostly traffic accidents. So people suing over being hit 
as, as a result of car accidents. Um, but what happens even in my cases is I'll even file a lawsuit. Say Mr. Smith is suing Jane Doe because Jane Doe caused a rear end collision. We're asking for a hundred thousand dollars in damages. Mm -hmm. It's filed in court, legit suit. Everything's fine. Okay. I don't seem to have any reason to think that this person is not the driver who caused the injury. Right. It's more a question to me of how much the damages are going to be. Right. But it's still got to go through the trial, right? Absolutely. We're pending, 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 and I get a notice. Mm-hmm. And my notice is from one of two places, sometimes both. Okay. It is usually from the court where I filed mm-hmm. and or a bankruptcy court. Okay. And it will say... The defendant Mm -hmm. in your case has filed a bankruptcy petition and your case has stayed pending the results of that. The result of the bankruptcy. Um, So all of a sudden, I am a standstill. Stuck. Yeah. It doesn't mean I did anything wrong. It doesn't mean that that person isn't liable. Liable. Not guilty, (laughs) but liable. Isn't responsible. It doesn't mean I shouldn't have sued that person, that I can't sue that person, that they didn't do it. Yes. It means I've gotten stuck in bankruptcy court. That makes sense then. Because I think I was a little bit confused to see just out of nowhere that charge, or not charge, um, case dismissed, bankruptcy court. And I was like, but that makes sense if they're saying essentially that any judgment against her is kind of going to be fruitless. Exactly. And that's what happens is if you, a civil lawsuit, and we yes. go back to this, is yes. a about civil money. lawsuit is about money. What you recover, you don't put somebody in jail. Right. You don't take away a life. You get money. That's yes. your award. That's your award if you prove your case and you win your lawsuit, yes. you get money. That's the only thing someone can give you. Yep. They taught us in torts. You can't get blood out of a turnip, right? Like that's Yeah. Old- so if there's no turnip, if there's no blood, if there's yes. no nothing, you have no money. You have nothing you can get yeah. in recovery and damages from your civil lawsuit. So your civil lawsuit is essentially null and void yeah. because you can't, get, it's a piece of paper. Right. You win a judgment and then what? You can't collect it. it. Is, yeah. It's just a piece of paper saying, yep, they did it. Yes. And so the bankruptcy court gets involved and they say, if there's any civil proceeding where a money judgment could be collected, this includes debt collection proceedings. Right. So it's not just like a civil tort, a civil you know, negligence yeah. case, wrongful death, defamation case, yes. that sort of thing. But if it's a civil case that's pending or concluded and has damages attached to it still. Okay. If there's any financial anything, it is all now wrapped up in bankruptcy, in the bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy court has primary jurisdiction and is going to decide they trump their jurisdiction trumps. Wow. And they decide, does this person have a right to bankruptcy? And if so, their assets are liquidated. Wow. And if there are any assets left, then there's a priority of who gets it. And any sort of new, newer judgment is at the bottom of the list. At the very bottom of the list. Ben. So they're going to have put out a notice of, hey, so that's you're what stuck ended in it. Okay. bankruptcy. And that's what happens. Fascinating. Okay. I do have my final thoughts questions for you. Final ones. Yes. Final thoughts. And you can give me your personal vibes or you can give me your lawyerly <laughs> vibes. So here's the thing. I don't think I drank enough wine for, for either, but. I think you've got this. For what? So, okay. We, you know, we talked. This has resurfaced, you know, Casey Anthony coming yes. back up all these years later. Some things that came to me, obviously, because she cannot be charged with murder. We talked about double jeopardy. Right. It would seem to me as a lowly 3L that perhaps talking about these things at this point, maybe the statute has run on the other charges, right? So she, say she admitted now to what she did or what her story is now, right? could have had criminal charges. I mean, that is obstruction of justice, at least. Absolutely could be. Maybe the, you know... The corpse, the what is it? Um, abuse of a corpse. Abuse of a corpse. Depending on how it's labeled in sort a Sort of like improper burial charges, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so maybe the statute has run on those. Right. Which maybe is why she's talking now. 
Very likely. Okay. That would be my thought because it seems As so her random. attorney, I that would was... advise her not to have said anything until those statutes ran. So, so yes. that was one of my questions is oh. that if you were her defense attorney, yes. what would your thoughts be on something like this? But I think you answered them. And this is probably something we could do a whole after chat about is funny enough, her extensive legal team was featured prominently in this mini series, giving their own statements. And these are, I would say, three or four attorneys, multiple investigators. Their um, current statements this from the not- prior legal team. Yes. And to be oh, clear, God. oh my goodness, he just <laughs> fell. Um, so this was her legal team from the trial. And to be clear, on a questionable note, um, she, was, she has now been, since the trial, employed by one of the investigators for the past 10-ish years. From the legal team. From the legal team. She met him at her trial through that. So, and I just took the MPRE. It looks bad. I just took the MPRE. Which is the multi-state professional responsibility exam. exam. Legal ethics. For Um, lawyer, well, for for, almost lawyers. For law students wanting to be lawyers. (laughs) The ethics. Ethics So, this rang a few bells for me. Yes. Um, and I haven't flushed them out completely because I will say they were very curated, clear statements. I don't think there was anything specifically said that violated a rule. You know, it was clear Casey was consenting to them giving statements. Um, they were often in the same room. Nothing they said seemed to be a violation of anything I know of. But it does raise the question, that seems to be... Like, a, a, just an improper position for an attorney to take. Um, and I just, your yeah. thoughts, even if it doesn't technically violate it, doesn't that seem off to you? It does seem off. It smells yes. bad. It looks bad. Um, whether it violates any specific rule or not, it, it doesn't have to in the court of public opinion, which yes. is what Casey Anthony has faced from the very beginning, which yes. you said, going back full circle, That is what we're dealing with is, yes, we have courts, but the court of public opinion is the loudest of them all. Yes. And for an attorney to be employing in any way. (laughs) Their defendant. Their defendant in a murder case. There's probably not a rule that says you can't no. in Florida. You'd have to check the Florida rules. Yes. And each rule, the funny thing is each state, in addition to their own like crimes, they Has actually their have their own ethics rules for attorneys. Yes. So they're, even though they're very similar, they're not all Slightly the same. Slightly different. Yes. So the ones that I have in Maryland and Virginia are not the same that they have in Florida. Right. So they're very Isn't well. Isn't are three different jurisdictions, <laughs> three different rules? I can't imagine. It's. Hard sometimes to keep up with them, but that's that's what we're so supposed to similar, do. Similar, but slightly different. <laughs> but you know what? You default by looking yes. them up. Yes. If you don't know, go look them up. Yes. That's that's the biggest thing that I can tell any real attorney, new attorney, <laughs> possible attorney is the biggest thing that you live your life by is if you don't know, find out. Yes. Go look it up. Don't presume. Don't ask. Don't, you know, it's just I think it goes out. back to what I said is that prior to law school, I was very confident in just saying things. Yeah. But now I think I understand the ramifications of that. Of, it's much more complicated and yes. you get in trouble. And so these attorneys, they seem to have been smart all this time before. So I am betting that yes. they probably have sussed this out much more than I already have. Have their own attorneys. Uh, right. Have had their own legal team. Yes. Discussing with them about this. But so they probably don't have an ethical violation or bar to employing a prior client. It's usually more based around current clients. Yes. Um, that you can't exchange favors um, with current yes. clients. So, okay, I guess maybe, so that's part of it. But I think for me, I guess my thought, because not all of the attorneys, but some of them are still practicing law. Right. And it seems, even if Casey gives her consent, which that's a mm-hmm. big part of it, you could consent to your attorney doing a lot of things. You can. And but, that's a huge part of it yes. that you're hitting. Which, and I, so I don't think they're really violating her her attorney-client relationship. But I do feel uncomfortable with someone who is a currently practicing law giving their personal beliefs on a former client. That feels wrong to me. And I it probably is not against a particular ethical rule, but I feel like that is something that maybe we shouldn't do, guys. Like, <laughs> it, 
it, yeah, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't good. look good to the public. It doesn't you look good to another attorney. You can't do it at trial. Attorney. You can't say, I personally believe this I person. I can't say anything about my personal beliefs about a client or a defendant or another party. I can't say anything. I can't even say if I think their hair yeah, looks good in front of the jury. It just gives you the ick that they are now saying, I know her as a person. I believe in my personal capacity. It gives me the ick. I might not be wrong, but it is the ick. So those were my final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Trust the ick. Trust the ick. Because there is an ick. And it, it may not, it doesn't have to be wrong to not be appropriate. It, or you know, it might be not ethical, be... but not right. And that is Correct. legal ethics in a nutshell. <laughs> And you're absolutely right. And she may very well have signed away, yes. have consented to them doing this, it. but it doesn't mean you should. Yes. And it does appear in this case that things have been capitalized upon. Yes. I don't know if we didn't even talk about the sort of son of Sam. Can you profit off your crimes bit of it? So we can come back around to that. I like that. (laughs) Yes. So there's that, but, but, but yeah, it, it doesn't look right when you're dealing with a case that has a murder trial. Yes. And then you've got civil lawsuits coming out of those trials. Yes. And 10 years later, 12, God, 14 years later now to, yeah. from the beginning of yes. it. So, yeah, she was acquitted in 11. So, But it started in 2008, and, and now we're talking about it in, in 2022, 2022 as a current relevant thing. Yes. It just... It's ubiquitous. I think that that's the thing with with OJ, with all of these. And I think the two that we will be addressing soon that will be ubiquitous for the next generations yes. are no, the Gabby exactly. Petito case and... Uvalde. Uvalde. It's got to be Uvalde as yes. the other. And I think that that is something that I was not alive when Columbine happened, but I know what Columbine is. And I think going forward, it will be the same way with Uvalde. And it will be the same way about the Gabby Petito case. So... The ones to remember. Yes. So yeah, okay, so thank you for doing happy hour with me. Yes. Yay for our first episode of yes. the Legal Weekly Wine. Guys, join us on yes. every Friday at four o'clock for happy hour for yes. the Legal Weekly Wine. It will probably not be this always long. this long, um, but hopefully you enjoyed it. Maybe I was listen so to the worried end. that I wasn't going to cover enough of the case. It was complicated, but if there's something you think we missed or yes. wine recommendations, drop them in the comments below. If the, if you have a case suggestion or something you want us to discuss as a, as a headline, we'd love to do it. Absolutely. Um, we may not know it all, but we'll at least ask pertinent questions and give a thought or two. So yes, thank you so much for joining us today. And this is so much fun. Yeah, it was fun too. Don't forget to um, talk with your own attorneys, seek your own legal advice because you never need a lawyer. Tell you, you do. Don't.